from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for April 12th, 2024. Checking the calendar, the clock is ticking. Monday is tax day, just in case you forgot. The Bucks have only two games left in the regular season without Giannis. The Brewers are out of town this weekend, but San Diego comes in for three games starting Monday. The Milwaukee Film Festival is underway. Country star Luke Combs is in town for two shows at AmFam. And at the Riverside on Sunday, it's Celtic women. It's getting busy in Milwaukee. Mm-hmm. Portuguese scientists accidentally made a mouse grow legs where his genitals should be. Ooh. Now Mickey's going to need a whole new wardrobe. <laughs> <laughs> The North Toledo police responded to a shots fired call. It turns out the shooters knew each other, and one of the shooters named Mr. Reed knew the cop who was the first on the scene. You see, Mr. Reed has been shot three times in just the last year. (laughs) He's not dead, so I don't know if that's good luck or bad luck. (laughs) Sierra Leone declares emergency after drug addicts dig up graves to get high on drugs from human bones. Well, suddenly marijuana doesn't seem so bad. (laughs) And finally, a New Yorker was in the middle of having a vasectomy when the earth shook. Well, he'll never have to answer the question, Daddy, where were you when the earthquake struck? (laughs) On the podcast today, we have Art Rothschild, Mike Helsel, Joel Driesang, and wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thanks, Max. A tough week overall. The Nasdaq down a half a percent, down 73 points on the week, closing at the bell at 16.175. The S&P down 1.6 percent, down 81 points, closing at 51.23. And the Dow Jones Industrial Average, a a very, very rough week, down 2.4 percent, closing at the bell at 37.984 for the year so far. The Dow now up just 1.3 percent, the S&P up 7.8, and the Nasdaq up a pretty stellar 8% still. And so, you know, I think absent the Magnificent Seven this week, or at least some of the Magnificent Seven this week, it would have been a very different week overall. You can see it just in the spread between the NASDAQ and the Dow. But Joel, really the the biggest motivating force, it seemed like for at least some of the week was inflation data and specifically the consumer price index that came in a little worse than what so many of us were hoping Um, signs that inflation just doesn't seem to be abating as quickly as we all hoped. Yeah, Kyle, the big investors are, you know, keep wondering uh, whether the higher interest rates that the Fed put in place are going to lower inflation. And um, the the long run answer is so far, yes, but we're not there yet. Um, So the numbers came in on Wednesday from the Consumer Price Index, which is the broadest measure of, uh, of inflation. And that actually went up for the uh, it was a little faster than it was in February and a little faster than it was in January. So it was 3.5% year to year. Now, that's the one that the Fed doesn't look at as closely. Um, that, that happens to be the... Um, the uh, the core no, personal here. consumption it's expenditures actually index. Actually, not the core, but yeah, the I personal don't. consumption uh, uh, expenditures index. And, and that one, thank you. And, and that one um, tends to be a little lower that runs a little uh, softer than, than the CPI. And that was at 2.5% in February. And that's closer to what the Fed wants. The Fed wants 2% inflation long term. Um, but um, Chair Powell last week from the Fed said that, you know, we're getting closer to 2%, but that, uh, that trip is sometimes bumpy. Yeah, and of course, I think you can slice the inflation data a thousand ways, and you can tell just about any story you want to tell, but it's never a good sign when picking the same indicator repeatedly, you're seeing signs that maybe it hasn't come down as quick. The one saving grace maybe on this week was producer prices, kind of a leading indicator for consumer prices more broadly, um, and producer prices showing signs that maybe it isn't quite as bad as we thought. Right, yeah, and and the Fed doesn't just look at that one index either. It looks at the CPN. It looks at the the producer price index, and that one actually uh, came in on a month to month basis. It came in lower than it did in February and lower than it did in in January, um, and that was looking better. The other thing about that is that um, the producer price index found actually that uh, goods that the prices of goods overall had declined. 
Um, and again, Chair Powell last week said that, you know, we're going to have to have three things happen to get down to that 2% goal, um, and that's for services to decline, goods to decline, and housing to decline. And housing's the sticking point, that's, and that's confounding a lot of economists. They're not quite sure. Um, th there are other signs that say that housing prices might be sort of tapering off, or at least not rising as much as they used to be. Um, and it's not showing up as much in the data yet. And of course, a bit of a pop this week in mortgage rates as, as, as interest rates more broadly moved higher. And so one more, I think, potential challenge to the housing market in general and the hopes that maybe spring would be the place where we finally saw some more houses into the market. Again, with the 30-year the mortgage back near 7%, I think I'm less inclined to put my house on the market if I'm getting three on my mortgage right now, knowing that I got to refinance or buy the new house at seven. And so I think that is one more challenge in kind of what we're looking at is it means prices probably stay high because to motivate me to move, you're going to have to pay up to buy my house. And so I think that's certainly part of the, the challenge right now. Another reason why we're waiting for the Fed to start lowering interest rates. And of course, Art, as we look at all this economic data, as we think about the Fed more broadly, it's easy to get caught up in the weeds. Um, I think you do a really good job of kind of putting in perspective what we're seeing and not just focusing on today, but, um, you know, I think trying to better understand here what's this mean for investors more broadly. Yeah, that brings up a, a Kinks song from the 60s, I'm tired of waiting. I'm so tired, tired of waiting, tired of waiting for you. So we're spending too much time, quite frankly, obsessed about what the Fed's going to do. I think the market, it's been an obsession. I'm tired of talking about interest rates. I'm tired of talking about where inflation is. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be doing it. It means we should be putting it in context. So I think the market has to change its focus, and we know it's going to start happening because they're going to start focusing on corporate profits that are beginning to be reported, you know, starting today. The fact that we had a bad week, forget about it. The fact that inflation is slightly higher than it was, uh, forget about it. It's a lot lower than it was two years ago. And I'm tired of the Fed having to, you know, explain why they're not lowering rates. I think they can hold their fire until there's a reason to stimulate the economy. Um, and I don't see that right now. This economy is crushing it. And corporate profits, we're going to find out. If corporate profits don't start crushing it, if these companies that are reporting, you know, even good earnings aren't suggesting that the future looks even brighter, then, you know, we could be heading for a fall. But maybe you deliberately didn't mention how well we're doing year to date. You know, you talked about a lousy week. It's one lousy week. We're still in the game. We don't know what inning because it doesn't end for us. We keep playing, you know, day after day, week after week, month after month. The NASDAQ set a record this week. Okay, it's up 8% still year to date. The S&P is still up close to 8%. Uh, so the NASDAQ went ahead. I think the S&P might have been ahead before that. And the Dow up one, great. We've got some dry powder. So long-term investors don't obsess the way the market seems to you know, on, on, you know, what the Fed's going to do and when, forget about it. They've done a tremendous job, and I'm tired of them being beat up by the market. Well, and I think the, the real challenge we face right now is that we are at the very onset of earnings season, and yet I think there are so many distractions from what actually ultimately matters for investors. It's all about earnings and interest rates, as we've said forever. And um, so if what matters is earnings and interest rates, well, interest rates is part of that conversation, and what the Fed does is certainly going to matter but it isn't at the expense of earnings, right? They have to fit together. And so, you know, the earnings outlook, not all that fantastic, but we're still talking about earnings growth here in the first quarter. We're still talking about pretty meaningful opportunities for earnings growth in the, the year or years ahead. And so as we really think through the conversation on what's this mean for investors, you know, I think we have to get back to fundamentals. We have to get back to what's this earnings season going to look like? How's it going to shape up? Um, and certainly that's been part of kind of my focus recently. And then, Mike, you know, I know you've had the conversation ad nauseum on inflation, on trying to put some of this in perspective. What are you telling clients right now? Yeah, I mean, so inflation was a little high, but when we sell off, it felt like a bit of an overreaction because it wasn't that high. Like, it's kind of in the realm of possibility. And most of the inflation was um, where we at? was shelter and auto insurance. That's about half of the inflation, right? And I look, looked up some numbers because I was just curious about kind of everyday things that people buy and where that's at kind of in a month over month basis. And groceries was at 0%. Like the food away from home, so when you eat out, that was up 0.3. Furnishings were down 0 0.1. 
hotels were zero flat, and daycare was 0.1. So the things that on an everyday basis that our clients and people use, it's been pretty flat. So it came in a little bit hotter. Okay, that's not the end of the world. And kind of to piggyback on what Art was saying about, so we had a lousy week. I mean, we've been up, what was it? Basically November through March, the S&P has been up, right? And on an average year, the market sees what, probably like seven-ish separate 3% dips in the market. That doesn't mean it's a negative year, but that can happen. So when you have a week like that, or a week like this, big deal. I mean, Art said it perfectly. I'll follow you anywhere, Art, with that passion right there. But that was, but you also, even in a positive year, you'll also get potentially 3% or 3, 5% corrections. So if you're down 2% or 25 on the Dow, okay, you've still got an, another, what, seven months left to go, you, you'll be fine. Yeah, I think we're along for the ride here. And the yeah. challenge, of course, is that you can't be too far out over your skis in these kinds of markets, that it does come back to the importance of balance. When you talk about a stock market that is a little expensive, when you talk about um, a bond market that clearly has more opportunities ahead than what we've seen in really the last 10 or 15 years. And so for investors that are concerned, rightfully so, there's plenty going on out there. And Art, I know JP Morgan CEO Jamie Diamond, Jamie Diamond had some stuff to say this week. You look at uh, Iran possibly entering a war now in Israel, and you know you're seeing some risk-off trades out there. The price of gold going up, the price of oil seeing a little spike at times, and so you know I think there's plenty to be concerned about, and and yet balance seems to continue to be the key. Yeah, one of my favorite subjects is compartmentalization. You know, how do we get through the volatility? And it's easy. We've been talking about this in the decades I've been here and that all of us have been here. Um, you need safe money. You need something. You need a lifeboat, you know, to get you through. And so when we put together a portfolio that might be 60% stocks and 40% um, fixed income, that 40%, if you're taking a 4% draw, as we've said many, many times, should last you 10 years. So we, you don't have to worry about these day-to-day -day, um, issues. And quite frankly, They've never been more significant. We have potential world wars starting in two parts of the world. Um, the Fed interest rate thing, again, all the, the fact that inflation is higher, uh, interest rates could be higher, but no one talks about the other side of interest rates. People are making more than they've ever made before in a long time, not ever, but in a long time on their fixed income. So if there's trillions of dollars, literally over $8 trillion, $9 trillion in safe fixed income, forget about bonds for the moment cash paying close to 5%, do the math. That's a lot of money that people have either that they're continuing to grow or that they can spend. And, and, and employment, I mean, it's unbelievable how solid employment and how low unemployment it is in, in this country. And despite the moans and groans, you can talk about the consumer price or the, you know, the consumer confidence, you know, in a minute, but uh, it, it, it's just like people are complaining because they're being inundated with bad news. But they're spending still like drunken sailors. And I think they may continue to, which could continue to propel the stock market higher. So despite Jamie suggesting that, you know, interest rates could be uh, as high as 8 percent, which they could, that would be a concern. Um, I don't think you have to worry about it for the I time think, being. I think, Art, it's a short-term concern. Long-term, it's opportunity for bond investors. And so uh, I had my copy of Stocks for the Long Run out earlier today, just looking up some historical data for a, a client question. And I was looking at the long-term government bond interest rate from 1929 to 2012. The average is 5.1% over that time period. And then we went through a stretch where we were below two, basically from 2012 all the way through 2022. And so when you look at the last decade plus of returns in your bond funds, a point in time in which interest rates on government bonds, again, this kind of safe place to park money, were so much lower than historical averages, it's no wonder that we got one, one and a half or two percent on our bonds over the last decade. And if you're talking about an environment in which the current long-term government bond rates are four and a half, roughly, well, I'd argue that that paints a picture of a market that looks a little more favorable, favorable for bonds. And just as importantly, if we do get that eight, again, not in the realm of what I think is likely, but always in the realm of what's possible, well, yeah, that's going to be a temporary pain. It's a longer-term gain for bond investors because 
Remember that the long-term average for stocks is right around 8 to 9%. And so if all you're doing is counting on bonds to be the, the carrier of, of risk for you now, you've de-risked your portfolio, you have less in stocks because you can afford to put more in the bond market. And so I'm not terribly concerned about that outcome beyond maybe the, the couple of years it might take to get there. I think, if anything, it's a great opportunity for investors to kind of revisit what portfolio balance looks like. Um, and yeah, there's always shakeups when you're making moves in the interest rate side of the world. There's always shakeups when, when stocks are bouncing around. But it's about looking at the opportunity that's created. And Joel, Art mentioned the consumer sentiment surveys that are out there. We got another uh, measure this week on how consumers are feeling. Yes, it's a preliminary uh, look at consumer sentiment from the University of Michigan, and it gets back to that kink song. Uh, uh, <laughs> basically, consumers are just sort of biding their time, uh, waiting for something you know more to happen with the economy. Although there was a, a little notion in there that more uh, consumers are uh, – expecting inflation uh, not to go down as, as much as it had been, and we, you know, which the numbers are showing. Um, but it was interesting because there was a, a Wall Street Journal poll of uh, consumers in seven states, and 74% uh, of them said that actually inflation had gone in the wrong direction in the last year. Well, you know, we, we discussed this last week. That's that's not right. I mean, it, last year, that uh, that 3.5% uh, inflation rate for the consumer price index was at five percent, and remember that's down from seven nine percent. You know, back in mid twenty twenty two. So it is going in the right direction. It's just stalled right now. I think uh, the calculus professor listeners that we have are probably a little upset about the lack of understanding of first derivative and second derivative and rates of change. So um, probably a little over huh? most. Yeah, but they probably, <laughs> okay. probably a little over most of our heads. But, you know, that's really the problem when you're talking about these kinds of things is it comes down to definition, right? It comes down to understanding what are we really talking about here? Are we talking about the fact that, yeah, inflation is still going up? That's not a great thing. We like a little bit of inflation, but if you just dealt with eight and a half and you're still dealing with three, I can understand why you might feel like inflation is still going in the wrong direction. On the other hand, the alternative to inflation is deflation. Price is going back down, and that's going to come with its own set of problems. And so I guess the point here is be careful what you ask for um, because you just might get it. Um, and that's probably not the place we want to be right now as an economy. You know, Mike, we're just at the tail end of tax season here. Um, plenty of takeaways, I think, for investors every year. Some things that we like to point out and areas that maybe are helpful, especially as we get later into the year and are talking about planning opportunities. You know, maybe this is a good time to kind of revisit uh, some key takeaways from tax season. Sure. Number one for all of our clients, I said it to you guys for the podcast, to everybody, please get yourself a tax professional. It is the smart thing to do. I know we have plenty of smart clients out there that can do their own taxes, but this is another kind of, you talked about risk. This is a way to help kind of de-risk some of your taxes. The second one I've seen a lot of lately is people have been um, doing Roth conversions, especially with the new kind of inherited IRA rules that you have to draw down. Your beneficiaries have to draw down their IRAs in 10 years. People have been making Roth conversions now to kind of help out their beneficiaries. But what I've seen on more than a handful of occasions is they don't talk to a tax professional to see how much they can convert. And so they get themselves into trouble because, as everyone knows, once that money leaves your IRA, that's considered income. So all of a sudden they convert too much. It pushes them into a different tax bracket. It causes some issue with Medic uh, Medicare. Yep. And so now you put yourself in a bind. So that's, again, where this tax professional com can come into play with kind of helping your planning of they can tell you how much you can convert and not move yourself into uh, that next tax bracket. And point three, get yourself a tax professional. <laughs> I cannot stress that enough. <laughs> no, I appreciate that, Mike. And I think the key here is that we're supposed to be part of your team, right? That the team includes good legal advice, good tax advice, um, and someone, a financial advisor, a, a registered representative that can help you to kind of walk through how do these pieces fit together? 
Um, and it doesn't mean that we're not a part of that conversation, but at the end of the day, you want someone whose specialty it is to help you navigate tax situations, who you can bounce those questions off of, because the last thing that we want you to do is pay more tax than you have to pay, whether that's today, tomorrow, 10 years from now. But if you run into making decisions based solely on reaction, don't run the idea by us, don't run the idea by the tax professionals, and give us a chance to really weigh in on, well, have you considered this? I think you do run the risk of making you know, some poor choices. The other thing that I think is so critical this time of year is just gathering up all of those documents that you need for your tax return is a great way for you to now start to put together the plan for this year. Not just what happened last year, but what are our expectations for 2024? Are things going to look different? Are they going to look the same? If we're doing Roth conversions or if we're doing contributions or qualified charitable distributions, is that really the thing we want to be doing again this year? And so, you know, we'll talk as we get later into the year about some planning ideas for summer. We'll talk, as we always do, about gifting ideas later in the year and year-end ideas when we get closer to Christmas. And all of these are kind of the opportunities for us in this setting to say, here's some of the stuff you should consider. But I think as you, uh, if you haven't already clicked send on your tax return, as you lick the stamp and put it on the envelope to get your tax return in the mail this weekend, just a reminder that it's helpful to have all those documents set aside in one place so that as you do try to navigate some of the, the later questions in the year of what you should do, you're able to pull that file right back out and say, well, here's what happened last year and here's what we think is going to happen going forward. With that, we enjoy doing the program for you. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at Landis.com. <laughs>